Hello and welcome to RBC Online. It is great to be here today and come and worship our God. Hey, just this passage here in uh, Psalm 115, I want to share this, uh, this verse just with us today. It says this, it says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be all the glory because of your love and faithfulness. I think there's so many times when we come to worship and we make worship about ourselves. We make it about our likes. We make it about the things that we want. We make it about our name. But this encourages us that it's not about us. It's about God. It's about His name. His name is the one to be praised. So as we come today, let us come and let us praise the name of Jesus. Let us lift His name on high and let us thank Him because of His love and faithfulness to God be the glory for the great things that he has done. Amen.
coming together and worshipping like we've just done. And we're going to continue in our time of worship. And it's time for the kids. It's time for RBC kids. It's time for some teaching. It's time for some worship. So kids, on your feet, on the couch, let's get ready. Adults and parents, let's lean in as well. Here's RBC kids.
doesn't love a good block party. Feedback toss! <laughs> Sorry. Um, I could use some lessons. <laughs> Which is why friendship is so important. Friendship is using your words and actions to show others you care. It's kind of hard to have a party without friends. And honestly, it's hard to even plan a party without friends. You need a tall friend to hang the lights. <laughs> you need a friend who can bake. Mmm. And if you've got a friend who's giving beanbag toss lessons, Tell them to give me a call. The point is, we need friends, and friends need us. And in today's story, we're gonna talk about what makes a friend a friend. That sounds like fun! It makes me wanna party! The Bible, it's 66 books of history stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter four, verses nine, through 12. The writer of Ecclesiastes tells us two people are better than one. They can help each other in everything they do. Suppose either of them falls down, then the one can help the other one up. But suppose a person falls down and doesn't have anyone to help them up. Then feel sorry for that person. One person could be overpowered, but two people can stand up for themselves. And a rope made with three cords isn't easily broken. Let's see how this might play out in someone's life today. Jackson slid into the small school theater and took a seat in the back row and waited for Mr. Ray, the music and arts teacher. It looked like there was only one other kid who showed up to build the set for the fifth grade production of Charlotte's Web, a mall from Mrs. Wiseman's class. Hey. Hi. The two boys sat there in awkward silence until Mr. Ray showed up. Ah, my set team, fantastic. You guys know each other? Kinda. Different classes. Well, you're gonna get to spend a lot of time together in the next two weeks as we build this set and get it painted. You guys got any experience with power tools? Jackson could see Amal shift nervously in his seat. No, I just, I don't wanna go on stage. Miss Wiseman said I could do this instead. Don't worry, I'll teach you what you need to know. How about you, Jackson? I'm pretty good with a hammer, and I didn't want to wear some silly animal costume. The two boys basically ignored each other as Mr. Ray showed them how to measure each piece of lumber for him to cut, and then he helped them lay out the pieces in a large frame. Now, this'll be one of the wall flats for the backdrop. We'll paint it as part of the barn. Amal, you want a hammer in these nails? Uh, I guess. I'll hold it more like this. Don't worry, you'll get it. I'll do this side. Jackson nailed together the entire flat while Amal still struggled with one corner. Ah, <sighs> what a klutz. But it was a different story the next day when they started to paint. This flat is part of our barn wall. I want you guys to paint a couple of chickens right there. Amal grabbed a brush right away. Oh, do, do you want them to look like real chickens or like cartoons? Nah, just give them your own personal spin. Amal got to work right away creating an entire palette of colors while Jackson was still trying to figure out which brush to pick. Now, I've got to run down to the art room. Amal, why don't you show Jackson how to get started? I don't really... Mr. Ray smiled at them both. He needs a hand. I think you guys will make a great team. Mr. Ray hurried out. Jackson and Amal avoided each other's eyes. <clears throat> well, I'll sketch an outline for the chickens. What do I do? Just, you know, fill it in. <sighs> I'm not really an artist. Jackson dipped his brush randomly in the blue paint and frowned at Amal's outline. Just have fun with it. Jackson swiped the blue brush, outlining a wing. <laughs> I've never seen a blue chicken. Oh. It's great. It'll stand out. Oh, uh, thanks. By the time Mr. Ray returned, Jackson was surprised to discover that he and Amal had already painted five brilliant hued chickens. Mr. Ray grinned. I've never seen a more flamboyant flock. Jackson held out his fist to Amal, and Amal, surprised, gave him a fist bump. 
Yep, see you boys tomorrow. The next day, Amal showed up with a bruised finger on his left hand. I can still paint with my right. What happened? Mr. Kunkel keeps putting me in as goalie during PE, and then I mess it up, and everyone on the team gets mad at me. Uh, do you stay on your toes? Keep your eye on the ball? No. I just panic when the ball comes at me. Look, I can show you some tips later in the parking lot, before my mom comes. Really? That would be great. And you know Jackson turned out to be a pretty good teacher because Amal managed to get two blocks during PE the next day. And when Jackson showed up to paint sets, stressed out by a math test, Amal grabbed his textbook. Fractions? Uh, I see all these weird numbers and I freeze up. You just have to break it down like this. With Amal's help, Jackson managed to stay calm during his test the next day. And by the middle of the next week, they had completed the entire backdrop for Charlotte's Web. Well done. I knew you two would make a great team. Amal's pretty okay. Jackson's not too terrible. Look, I know you guys are really different from each other, but it's boring if all your friends are just like you. Together, they started gathering wood scraps and wiping off brushes. Seriously, one of the wisest men to ever live pointed this out. Solomon. Solomon? Yep. He's this king in the Bible. He was a builder and an artist and super rich too. But for all the things he had, you know what he valued most? Friendship. He says it like this. Two people are better than one. They can help each other in everything they do. Hmm. On point. Yeah. Amal held out his fist and Jackson tapped it with his own. Maybe Solomon and Mr. Ray were onto something. Okay, here are four things you can learn from those verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. Number one, friends get more done when they work together, which makes a whole lot of sense. Planning a party goes a lot faster when I've got someone to help me out. Which brings me to number two, friends help each other. A true friend doesn't just sit back and watch when it's obvious you need a hand. Little help, little help here. Ah! Number three, friends stand up for each other. You better not be messing with one of my friends. I will totally fight you. Unless, you know, you're bigger than me, then I will not fight you. In which case I will totally reprimand you with some carefully planned certain words. Just don't mess with my friends, okay? Uh, and number four, friends help you trust God. You may have a lot of different friends in your life, but a true friend, one that lasts, is the kind that helps you make wise choices. The kind of friend you can talk to about what you believe honestly, and who can help your faith in Jesus grow. So here's the one thing to remember today. Choose your friends carefully. I think you should try to be a friend to everybody, whether it's a friend you choose or not. But when you're deciding who to spend most of your time with, you should choose carefully. Ask yourself, is my friend helpful? Would they stand up for me? Do they help me trust God more? And while you're at it, ask yourself this, am I a helpful friend? Would I stand up for others and help people trust God more? Hmm. When you want to find good friends, one of the best things you can do is to be a good friend. And never forget, that Jesus is your ultimate friend. He is always there for you, no matter what. So, be on the lookout for good friends this week. When you choose wisely, you can't miss. Jesus, you have been so faithful. Jesus, you have been so true. Thankful, cause I never had a friend like you. Help me to be who you've been to me, to everyone I see. Let us love one another with a love like no other yet. That's the way you love us, God. Never turn away, you are with us every day, yeah. That's the way you love us, God. Your love is always been beginning to end. There's never been a better friend. So You with me in the darkest valley You with me on the mountain top I'm thankful that you never leave me And that your love will never stop Help me to be 
you've been to me, to everyone I see. Let us love one another with a love like no other, yeah. That's the way you love us, God. Never turn away, you are with us every day, yeah. That's the way you love us, God. Your love is always been beginning to end. There's never been a better friend. So let us love one another with a love like no other, yeah. That's the way you love us, God. I wanna thank you for being. How good is it to be able to worship together online today? My name is John McDonald and I'm the youth coordinator here. It's awesome to be able to worship with you. We had an awesome time over Friday and Saturday with the youth camp experience. It was an incredible event. We had Abe Johnson come along to speak and share with the youth and we are so excited to see uh, how God is going to carry through uh, our youth as we continue on through the end of the year. Well, Operation Christmas Child is, uh, is, is ongoing at the moment, and it's an awesome opportunity for you to be a part in, in God changing lives all around the world. Box Collection Day is October 25th, uh, and yeah, it's, it's an awesome opportunity. So make sure, if you haven't already, to grab yourself a shoebox from the hub uh, and just put some gifts in there. We're going to collect them uh, during the service on October 25th. And they're going to go out uh, to, to, to people who, who won't usually be able to get uh, Christmas presents. And, and, and these, these gifts, even though that they're small, they, they really do uh, have a huge impact in, in changing people's lives. So it's an awesome thing. Remember, Box Collection Date, October 25th. Well, we are now going to come into a time of offering. And I just want to share a passage from 2 Corinthians uh, 9 that says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. This time of offering, it's it's not out of a, a compulsion or regret to give. We're not giving because we need to or we feel like we should. We should be joyful in our giving, knowing that we are playing a part in seeing God's kingdom grow in this place. Uh, the uh, options to give uh, will be on the screen now and you can click the, uh, the button to give. And right now, as we, as we uh, take up our offering, let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for all that you have given us. Thank you that you love us so much that you would create us, that you would send us a saviour in Jesus, that you would give us hope, that you would give us life. And Father God, as, as we give to you now, we want to give joyfully. We want to give joyfully to see your kingdom grow in this place. And we pray that you bless our giving in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's now time to grab out your Bibles, your notepads and your pens as we continue in our sermon series and stories of hope.
Well, good morning, everyone here in the room and those who are online. Isn't it wonderful to be gathered worshipping? Anyone agree with me? It's great, isn't it? Wonderful. This morning is the last in our Stories of Hope series. Even though I know you'd have to agree with me if you know much about uh, the Bible that we could spend the rest of the year, couldn't we? Just going through stories of hope from the scriptures or in fact, we could spend many years, I think, if we started to just go through all the stories of hope that are in the lives of the people in this room. Isn't that right? Because every time that Jesus enters a situation, there's hope that enters the situation. Isn't that true? And that's what we're talking about today. But this morning we have just one final story of hope to revel in from the Bible. It may be new to you this morning or it may have been you've heard it many times. And whichever is the case, I hope that you'll be ready, that you'll be ready to be moved in your heart to hope. Whatever your situation is right now, as we follow through this story together, because I believe that God wants to touch each of our lives with hope and to encourage us as carriers of hope this morning. Isn't that good news? Let's read our story of hope together. This one is from John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptising more disciples than John. Although in fact it, wasn't Je it was not Jesus who baptised but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jo Joseph Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they're the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I'm he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving a water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields 
They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you've reaped the benefits of their labour. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. So now we've heard the story together. And I just want to encourage us today towards three reasons why this is a story of hope for you and for me and for this world. Just three reasons. Firstly, this is a story of hope because Jesus went to Samaria. If we see this story as only a chance and unscheduled but beautiful moment between a tired Jesus and a lonely woman at an ancient well on a hot day, we would be missing a significant reason for hope for this whole world in this story. This meeting was random for her, but it wasn't random for Jesus. It was the plan of God for these two to meet this day. You and I don't just happen to be here in this place of worship this morning. Every encounter with God is in his plan. And God's plan is the most beautiful plan for us. It is to rescue, to restore, to rebirth, to reconstruct, to reconcile all creation, and that includes you and me, to greater than their original beauty and greater than their original worth. Ephesians 1, 9 to 10 puts it like this. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfilment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Greater than our original beauty and greater than our original worth. And Jesus was working every day on seeing God's plan fulfilled. It was more important to him than eating, he says at the end of this passage. Lives were being blessed, people were being healed, souls were being cleansed, community was growing. But then surprisingly, just when his prominence is rising in Judea, he's got a great ministry happening, baptising more people than the amazing John the Baptist who turned the whole country on its head. God's plan, not man's, meant Jesus travelling from the south near Jerusalem to Galilee in the north to spread the good news further under the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the problem seemed to be that it was that between Judea and Galilee was Samaria, where our story is set today. You see, Samaria was not a place to go for a godly Jew. It was the quick way, but most Jews, especially those who consider themselves close to God, holy, they'd take the alternative route by going around Samaria doing anything they could to avoid going through Samaria. Now, the history of this went back hundreds of years to a time when the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. They took almost the entire population captive, exiling them to the Babylonian Empire. All they left behind were the lowest classes of society because they didn't want these lowly regarded people in Babylonia. So these poor people who were left behind got on with their life and they intermarried with other non-Jewish peoples who came slowly into the region and the Samaritans emerged as an ethnic and religious group. Samaritans had a shared heritage of faith with the Jews. They claimed Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as their fathers, but they only accepted the first five books of the Bible as true and their faith had become mixed with the concoction of other superstitious superstitions and religious ideas. Sounds like a lot of the world today to me. The Jews in Jesus' time despised them and they avoided them even more they would avoid Gentiles. That's why the parable of the Good Samaritan of Jesus is such a powerful and provocative story. Feelings ran so deep between them. For example, for the Jews, as we heard in the passage, Jews worshipped on, in Jerusalem. The Samaritans had built their own temple to God on Mount Gerizim. 
But the Jews had done the neighbourly thing and burned it down in about 128 BC. That's why the woman says, our ancestors worshipped on Mount Gerizim. It was fair to say there was no love lost between these people groups. And John says, Jesus had to go. Needed to go. Was determined to go through Samaria. That tells us a lot about our God, doesn't it? Why? Because Jesus had tremendous hope and a plan for these people who everyone else had written off. That is a reason for hope for us all and for this world this morning. When everyone else has given up, Jesus always has hope and a plan of restoration. And friends, he still has today. Verse 5 says, So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Jesus came to Jacob's well, where so long ago Jacob bought this very land and built an altar to God and called it El El Elohi Israel. That's great, um, great Hebrew there, isn't it? Was that good Hebrew? Mighty is the God of, he, of Israel. Jacob sent a well in that place, a well of, blessing, of God's blessing, and that well gave water. It gave so much water as the, Jesus, as the woman reminded Jesus. All of Jacob's sons, and I guess their families, and all his flocks and his livestock, they could all drink from it. Now that is some well, Jacob's well. And the woman said, do you really think you can give something greater than that, Jesus? And you know, we know that's exactly what Jesus was there to give, something greater than that, to fulfil in the lives of these people what Jacob's well was only ever a picture of, the living water of full life welling up through relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't believe for a minute that Jesus was at Jacob's well by accident. He was there as he is with us today as part of his plan of God to restore, to heal and reclaim what belongs to him. And friends, everything belongs to him. You belong to him. And to bring life. These Samaritans, people who had not heard from God for so, so long that his voice was only a vague and confused memory. These people who had wandered so far, these people who everyone else had given up on, Jesus was here to heal and restore and to reclaim and to satisfy their thirst for life, real life. And he's here today for the same reason. At a time when they weren't expecting it, Jesus, their Messiah, came into their lives and he came to bring them not condemnation, not subjugation, but hope, wonderful hope, and life to the full. When we get to the end of this passage, we hear the joyful and hopeful cry of the people of Sychar, this man is the saviour, not just for the Jewish people, but also not just for us, for the Samaritans. This man is the saviour for the world. Their eyes had been opened and their hearts changed by the love and the grace and the hope that comes through Jesus to see that this whole world belongs to him and he's here to reclaim us all. This man really is the saviour of the world and this is reason for hope today for everyone who hears this message. The second reason this is a story of hope is because Jesus met with the woman at the well. <clears throat> we see here how God works. In God's plan, the world is changed one life at a time because every life matters. And so as his followers, when we're tempted to think that in the world we live in at the moment, that to be part of God's plan, it's just too big a project. Jesus breaks it down to this. Just touch one life, as Dan said a few minutes ago. That's what I do, says Jesus. Just touch one life. Perhaps the only thing, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps the only thing more shocking than that Jesus would go and touch and bless Samaria was the one person through whom he chose to fulfil God's plan. Jesus is sitting in the heat of the day, tired from the journey by Jacob's well. A woman comes to draw water from the well and Jesus asks her for a drink. She's shocked. She's confused. Perhaps she's even fearful. She's alone, male to female, 
<coughs> Jew to Samaritan, righteous to unrighteous, holy to very damaged life. Even for Jesus to touch the cup of a Samaritan would make him unclean. Yet he says to her, give me your cup. And he enters into a discussion with her that reveals that he knows her. He knows her confusion. He knows her thirst. He knows her religious baggage, her relationship baggage. He knows her deepest thoughts. Remember when she went back to the village, she cried out, he told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? Now, I guess that's a hyperbole, isn't it? He didn't sit there and tell her what she had for breakfast last Tuesday and all that sort of stuff, did he? But what it means is it shows that she felt her innermost self completely revealed in his presence, that nothing was hidden, but in a wonderful life-giving way. He saw her with compassion and understanding, not judgment, as though he were on her side in life, as though he were on her side in life. Isn't it a wonderful reason to, for hope to think that Jesus, when you're with him, it's like he's on your side in life? This is a story of hope for every single one of us because Jesus met with the woman at the well. It shows that the God of the universe is interested and compassionate and understanding about the universe inside each one of us. And I know there's a universe, isn't there, inside of me and there's one inside of you. Often of confusion, of misunderstanding, of all sorts of feelings. And Jesus cares. He understands. Even if you think you would not be worthy of his interest, he's interested in you as though he's on your side in life. The last person before this that Jesus had spoken to in this intimate way was in John 3, was Nicodemus, the powerful male leader and teacher of all of Israel. And now Jesus shares in the very same way with her, with the same focus on her, the same respect for her the same hope for her. One of the things I love about this passage is it shows that the Lord knows it all. Do you ever, like me, find yourself thinking, I'd like to be closer to God, but I know there are things that are, I'm thinking or things that are wrong in my life and I've got to fix them first before I can come nearer to him? Do you ever feel like that? She knew the issues in her life, but she found that he knew them too and that he had drawn near to her that she could be in his presence with her life open to him and she could feel herself being changed from the woman hiding in life and without hope to a woman with hope in God and a testimony about Jesus. It's such a message of hope for us all that our God is the God who chooses intimate encounters with people who don't have it all together. It's such a message of hope for us all that our God... Sorry, I get a bit emotional sometimes. Sorry. <laughs> It's such a message of hope for us all that our God is the God who chooses intimate encounter with people who don't have it all together. The one who wills that we give him our dirty cup of water. He already knows what's in it, filled with our problems, with our fears, with our doubts, to allow ourselves to be blessed and saved and restored and filled by him. This is a story of hope for us all today. And thirdly, this is a story of hope because Jesus offers us and her the living water first. I think this story is amazing in so many ways, but none more so than the order of Jesus' conversation. If you or I had met the woman at the well knowing all the issues in her life, I wonder where we might have started the conversation. He asks her for a drink. She queries whether that's a good idea. And he says straight away, without hesitation, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Wow. That's what I love. I love this. If you knew who I am, you would ask and I would give. Think about it in your own life. Jesus saying, if you knew who I am, you would ask, and I would give. I just find that amazing, don't you? 
If you knew who I am, you would ask and I would give. And how many ways and situations might that apply in your life today? And especially if you knew the gift of God that is available. Living water, life to the full, pressed down and running over, life welling up to eternity like a bubbling underground spring that can never fail because it's actually the life of Jesus that will never fail. If you knew who I am, says Jesus, you would ask and I would give. I give freely and generously and with grace to those who ask. If you knew who I am, you would ask because you would know I am able. No matter what the need or how dry you are, even if you would look at this passage today and say, I shouldn't have run dry. He says, if you knew who I am, you'll ask and I'll give. He hasn't even got to saying he knows her theology is wrong, her culture is demonised, or that her personal life is riddled with issues. That would have most people just leaving her alone by herself at the well in the heat of the summer sun. He says, if you knew me, you would ask and I would give. Grace overflowing, grace upon grace, as John says in chapter 1. That's what we receive through Jesus Christ. You see, it's the life of Jesus coming in that pushes out the bad stuff, that reorient, reorientates the compass of our lives and that relieves the burden of guilt and regret. It's the water of Jesus welling up within us that quenches our thirst and fills us to overflowing with life. It starts and it continues with him. He is our source. He's our well within. He never will run dry. He's our eternal well of life that will never fail. He's our story of hope today. This is as true whether it's our first encounter with him or after many years. Open yourself to him just as you are. If you're thirsty, if you're lonely, if you're worried, if you're far from him, Open yourself to him. We all know today who he is. The woman at the well has told us who he is. The whole town has told us who he is. He's the saviour of the world. He's our saviour. He's your saviour. He's here for you. Ask and he will give. This is our story of hope for you today. I want to just finish this time together in prayer. I wonder if we might stand together as we pray. We've had three, I think, amazing reasons for hope out of this story. I just want to give us opportunity to pray for each of those um, situations in our life where this might apply. Let's just close our eyes together. And firstly, I want to make this as an encouragement for any for whom an encounter with Jesus is new. You identify this morning or today, whenever you're hearing this, as being like the woman at the well. You might have even been in church before, but you've never really encountered this Jesus. I just want to invite you to say in prayer, Lord Jesus, I give you my cup. It's a pretty dirty cup. But I also receive your gift, your beautiful free gift. Jesus, please. Give me your living water. Come into my life, I pray. And we'll work all the rest out together. For others, and there might be many, for whom in some specific way it applies to you when you hear the words, when you hear the Spirit saying, the words of Jesus, if you know who I am, then ask and I'll give. I just want to leave a moment now for you to ask whatever's on your heart today. Whatever you want to ask, Jesus, you can ask him right now. And for all of us who know him, we know that the bubbling stream of Christ is in us by faith. I often think of it myself as like a candle that can never be blown out within. Let us, ask, let us ask him again today that his bubbling stream of, of overflowing life will well up in us and overflow in joy and hope in our lives and for others so that we might be filled with life, be, be filled with the water that means we're never thirsty for anything else outside him and so that we might be in that place. We might be the one by the well 
who can touch just one other person this week with hope because of Jesus' name. Lord, we pray these things this morning, thanking you for all these stories of hope, thanking you, you are the God of hope, thanking you, you are better than we could ever have imagined. You come to us now and you say, I'm here. Be filled with my water, the living water of hope. Be filled, my people, filled to overflowing with real life. I've come to give it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the Kingdom come and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your son you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our Savior died. Let's praise him today. stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of Christ was born and the spirit with the flame now this gospel truth of all shall not
Isn't it wonderful today that we've been able to come, open God's word, worship together and just be filled again with the goodness of God. Well, we thank you for being part of today and uh, we want you to know it doesn't finish today. Uh, Right now we're going to open up our RBC online foyer and uh, this will be on Zoom and it's a great way for you to connect, to talk with some of our hosts, meet some of our our leaders and meet with some other people as well. So in the link, uh, there's a link now that's just dropped into the chat so you can go ahead and, uh, and click that or if you need any more information on how to join then please just speak to one of the the hosts put something in the chat and they'll be able to help you to get connected so that'll start now and uh we look forward to seeing you on there otherwise we'll see you back uh next week at 11 a.m for our rbc online service god bless and go well